Welcome to another episode of the Baseball Insiders. I'm Adam Weiner here as always with Robert Murray and not here are the Los Angeles Dodgers. Their season is over, mercifully ended by the 89 win San Diego Padres. The NLCS is set, Bert. The ALCS not quite done yet, but there might be one more surprise in store, even though you and I were both split on Guardians Yankees entering the series. We'll talk about it all, but did you expect to be doing a Dodgers postmortem this early? Um, first of all, hello, Adam. Uh, happy birthday. Very uh, wait, did, What are you doing to celebrate, first of all? Uh, I don't know. I can't decide if I want to go to the game tonight and sit through a rain delay or sit at home and melt alone. So probably the second thing. That I'm totally fair, but again, happy birthday. And also to answer your first question, I in a million years did not expect to be talking about the Dodgers missing the postseason this early. Holy crap, Adam. I have, I cannot tell you the last time I have been that glued to a game in my life because it, at first through the first five innings, it seemed like the Dodgers were in total control. Um, and I thought game five was going to go back to Dodger stadium and it would be, a high stakes winner take all game five going to the NLCS. And then the Padres happened. And what once like, obviously there was a lot of different things that happened in that game. Um, and then especially what was it? The sixth inning that they rallied or was it the seventh, seventh, seventh inning? Um, that was exactly why the Padres and so many other teams try to trade for Juan Soto for moments like that. And also his base running skills ended up getting them another run in that game. Um, I'll tell you, did not expect to be talking about the Dodgers this early, but the Padres always had the talent to take down the Dodgers. And that was one of their goals or one of their primary goals this season. In addition to winning the world series was taking on the Dodgers. Lo and behold, they did it. And they couldn't do it during the regular season. They faced them seemed like every week of the second half, they went five and 14. Like we talked about on the year and then when it got to the October matchup it just didn't matter and who knows with the rest versus rust we, we can't talk about this series and this game without talking about the playoff format in general would love yeah. your thoughts on on the you know rejiggering there the shifting around what forces contributed to this unbelievable upset but it can't be denied that after all that time off with Mike Clevenger in game 1 the Dodgers encountering a Padres team coming off beating the Mets unable to set their rotation the way they would have wanted the Dodgers win game one it's only a two-run win they blow them out early they hold on late who saw this series ending in four at that point in favor of the Padres after that they don't win another game and obviously it takes a tremendous rallying game four to make it happen but the Dodgers starter gives them an inning and a third in game three that's less than ideal the Dodgers can't rally with the rally goose in game two and all sorts of suspect Dave Roberts moves lead to a game four win in San Diego for the ages. Yeah, I'll tell you, the Padres winning three games in a row against the Dodgers was not on my bingo card whatsoever. And like all the things that you just mentioned, and like the, the Dodgers getting upset um, and all these other upsets happening throughout the postseason so far has been it's led to the question of, is this postseason format flawed? Um, I can get the arguments for both sides. Like, I th I mean, having the Dodgers, the Mets, the Braves, and then potentially the Yankees tonight if they lose, all out of the postseason before the CS, I mean, that's it's not great. But also, I like it. I like this format because you have so many more matchups and it gives you the possibility for more upsets. And I'm always a fan of the underdog. Um, and it also kind of makes me wonder, or something that popped into my head is like, figure during March Madness, we always root for, let's say, like the 14 seed against the three seed or the two seed or the 15 seed against the two seed. Um, but yet when it happens in baseball, people are asking for the playoffs to be completely like changed and have the format changed. And I wonder why that is. Maybe it's just fans being upset that the team is out already, but um, I currently like the format of this. I'm a huge fan of it. Um, so far, we've seen probably the most unpredictable postseason in baseball history. And it also, Adam, it is reflected in our predictions because I remember on the last show, I said that our predictions could not get any worse. And then baseball said, hold my beer. 
Yeah. Um, and here we are at Banana Land. And we know you don't like beer. So, like, typically baseball saying hold your beer is already a nightmare for you because you're like, now I have this beer. But yeah, in hold this my even worse. Yeah, <laughs> hold my high noon, hold my seltzer, <laughs> hold my newly discovered pizza. Um, I, I'm also on board with the playoff format in general. Uh, there's sort of, I, of course, I can hear the, you know, the old time viewpoint that, you know, the best team doesn't always win the title. Sure. Um, I don't think the best team always wins the title. I mean, there, there's no sport where the best team always wins the title. The NBA is the closest. You can pretty much map out the conference finals and the finals in that sport. Is that better? I, I mean, some parts of America maybe think it is. They, they get used to the Michael Jordans and the Kobe Bryants and the Shaqs of the world. I gravitated to baseball as a kid because I did not think that was terribly exciting. I didn't root for one of the three NBA teams that was always in the mix for the finals. And so, therefore, baseball offered me something different. Uh, I was lucky enough as a Yankees fan. Yeah, I grew up a Yankees fan in New York, and I was lucky enough as a kid that my team was always in the the finals, the World Series. But they really had to fight, scratch, and claw to get there, and there was no discernible reason why they should be dominating as much as they have. And there hasn't been a repeat champion since those Yankees for good reason. Because it's really hard. Um, I think an interesting point too is that in March Madness, we root for these 14s over threes and these 15s over twos because we don't think it's going to disrupt the end of the bracket. Like, you can root for an individual right. upset and you can throw all your energy behind a 15 over a two with pretty secure in your knowledge that they're probably going to lose their next game and it's going to be this fun, singular moment you can frame. Baseball, yeah. all these teams are on fairly equal footing. The Padres say what you will about Dave Roberts bullpen calls outworked the Dodgers. They have star power. They needed to win these games three and four at home. And they went to Joe Musgrove and Blake Snell against injured Tony Gonsolin and Tyler Anderson. They had the advantage in both of those pitching matchups. They had Juan Soto. They had the stars playing better under the bright lights. The Phillies, the defense is lacking. The bullpen has lacked for most of the year and is coming around now. They don't have a full five man rotation that scares you. But they have Bryce Harper, JT Riomuto, Kyle Schwarber, Nick Castellanos, uh, and Brandon Marsh, of course, the big five. Uh, just kidding. But everybody knows these are like 87, 88, 89 win teams. Regular season didn't go the way they wanted them to. But they're they're not just dangerous and lucky. There's a ton of talent on all these teams. And Padres, Phillies should be an all-time clash for who gets to go to the World Series. Yeah, I'm totally agree. It feels like I'm a broken record. I basically agree with everything that you say, but like you're – you're right, though. It's like that series. Obviously, it's the underdogs. It's a matchup of the underdogs. But those two teams, um, if you go back a few years, they in the same offseason, they ended up the, the Padres signed Manny Machado mm -hmm. and the Phillies signed Bryce Harper. And that was supposed to mark the beginning of each new era. Uh, maybe the Padres made a couple signs before that. But like that was the one that really cemented them. of like, OK, we're serious about contending. And yeah, it took them a few years. But here they are, and for me, this is a this is the beginning of the window for the Phillies because their rotation is. I mean, they got pieces there that are going to be there for quite a while. Um, they got an offense where they got Harper signed long term, Schwarber, Castellanos signed long term, Real Muto signed long term, Brandon Marsh. I'll tell you, um, I'm glad you mentioned him because I before you ended up being the co-host now with car or back in the day with Carm back in the day as of two months ago. <laughs> um, I, um, I mentioned the Brandon Marsh trade as a potential under the radar move for the Phillies that could pay off dividends in the future. I didn't expect it to be this season, um, but the Phillies have Kevin Long and he is a highly regarded hitting coach who I think deserves um managerial recognition and the Phillies identified some stuff in March's swing that they could clean up. And they thought that long was the perfect guy to do that. And so far we've seen those adjustments work off. He had that huge home run in the, um, in the playoff game or in the playoff series just recently. And they think they can unlock all of his potential and he's got the potential to be a very good player. There's a reason why the angels were so hesitant to give him up in past deals. Like teams would ask for Brandon Marsh and, the Angels would say no. Obviously, like the Phillies parted with quite a bit. Logan O'Hoppy or Logan O'Hop. I might be pronouncing that. People wrong. have been saying O'Hoppy, and every time I want to go, there's no way. But I yeah. think it is. I think so. It's like it doesn't sound right, but I think it might be right. But yeah. 
Um, like that's like that was supposed to be like the number one prospect in the Phillies organization. So they didn't give they 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 gave up a pretty sizable haul here. But Brandon Marsh that could be their long term center fielder like going forward, and that's something that they've needed for years. Good work by Dave Dombrowski. Good work by Dave Dombrowski, who I feel like I end up complimenting wherever he goes. And he wears out his welcome with the farm system gutting. But what do you guys want? Like, do you want to win a ring? Do you want to get to the playoffs annually? He got the dot. He got the Tigers there every year. He got the Red Sox to a franchise record before they chased him out of town. And everybody laughed at this Phillies team and he built them for October too. No, he absolutely did. And like, you know what? I, I'm prospects are basically a lottery ticket because you don't know exactly what you're going to end up getting with them. And obviously sometimes it hurts to part with those prospects, but the, the results are, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, everywhere that Dombrowski has gone, he's been competitive and he's turned that Phillies team around fired a manager mid season that not everybody agreed with. Um, and Rob Thompson, man, I mean, he, Dombrowski and Thompson are pushing all the right buttons right now. Um, and I don't blame you, Kurt, one bit for wanting Dabrowski back with the Tigers. I would want him back too. Um, but I promise I'm not pandering to Kurt or Mark Powell, uh, both Tigers fans here at Fan Sided, but I still think the Tigers are in very good hands here. I, I tend to agree with you there too. They just, we have to see it, but I do think as of now, it does feel like they are being well handled. There's also some prospects in the Phillies pipeline. Andrew Painter and Mick Abel are like top, top tier pitching prospects. Uh, so it's possible that the fruits of Dombrowski's labor haven't even paid all the way off yet. But the Phillies are here because the Braves are gone. Our other golden boys, the, the Dodgers and Braves, the two gold standard organizations, along with the Mets, the Mets lose in the wild card round. You and I have this debate. Oh, whose future would you rather have? Like the locked up Braves or the spend whatever they need to get back to the top Mets. And then the Phillies just bowl over both of them. They're the last NL East team standing. The Philadelphia home field advantage is incredible. Um, you and I are both undeterred by the fact that the Golden Boys, the, the Dodgers and Braves, are gone. Um, I think that's upset a lot of people. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about them individually. Yep. But does this take any shine off either franchise for you? Or is this sort of a matter of like, hey, them's the breaks. Like the Dodgers did not hit with runners in scoring position at all. The Braves went to a hostile road environment, tied 1-1, and couldn't get it done. Championship hangover is tough. They lost a key reliever earlier in the series who got Tommy John. Uh, you know, Tyler Matzik did not appear in the DS. Michael Harris was fantastic. Vaughn Grissom probably going to get a chance to shine next year. But again, the Yankees in the 2000s, those are your last back-to-back -back champions. Maybe we can't draw any grand conclusions here, and maybe two great teams just got outworked by underrated great teams. Yeah, I think for it doesn't take the shine off of either one of these teams. Uh, like for the Dodgers, they're obviously like one of the best regular season teams ever. Um, winning 111 games is nothing to slouch at. And, um, and the Braves too, like they're this is year two or year three of an extended window. So to me, it does not take any of the shine off. Um, same with the Mets too. But that being said, these teams have a lot of questions to answer in the offseason, Adam. And that is where it's going to determine how shiny these teams are going forward. Like, also, you mind if I go on a little rant here? Uh, yeah, I got all the time in the world. Go crazy. There we go. Beautiful, my guy. So the Dodgers, they have to figure out um, their pitching situation because they have Kershaw, Andrew Heaney, and Tyler Anderson as free agents. Um, they have um, Cody Bellinger's option or – they got, they got to figure that out. Um, and to me, I think he might, I think he, what, he's a non-tender candidate. I want to make sure that's right. Yeah. I believe I that think, is true. I don't think there's, I don't think you can justify keeping him at that rate. Um, and then they also got to figure out Justin Turner's situation. He's got a club option. And I wonder if they could, cause I, he's a very, he's a valuable like component to that team, especially in the locker room. I wonder if they can pick up that option and then rework his deal to a two year deal um, to take some of the the burden or take some of the money away from year one um, and spread it out over two years. So that's something I'm, I'm, can, I'm wondering about there. Um, and obviously you got the Braves. The big one is Dansby Swanson and what they do there. Um, 
I still think that they re-sign him. Um, but as Freddie Freeman's situation proved last year, I mean, that's – I mean, there's no guarantees in free agency, Adam. And then with the Mets especially, you have DeGrom, who said he's going to opt out. You have Edwin Diaz, who I think – is a very strong candidate to get a hundred million dollars plus um, in free agency. Um, who's also a free agent right now. You got Brandon Nemo. Um, I'm forgetting some others here. Like they got a bunch of different free agents on that team. Um, and then you got to figure out if you're going to resign them or resign them all, who you're going to resign or who you're going to target free agency. The Mets might look the most different of all the teams above um, with the Dodgers being second, but Long term, they're set up to be good, um, to be very good, I should say. Um, but that doesn't mean they're without questions. Losing the way that they did does breed overreactions, right? You, you will see fans go, "Man, do we have any chance to offload that Mookie Betts contract?" If the Yankees lose tonight, you're going to hear the same thing about Giancarlo Stanton. Uh, and if the Yankees do get eliminated, which is is people are calling a huge upset, it's barely an upset. I mean, we, we both were on the Guardians before the series started. Uh, Jameson Tyone against Aaron Savali in game five in a bullpen game with Class A, Karen Chak, and Trevor Steffen all rested. Like, Yanks could win, Yanks could lose. And, and we'll have a whole lot to talk about their future as well. Uh, <laughs> no matter what the, I mean, eventually the season will end and we'll talk about their future. It could be as soon as Thursday. Um, I wanted to run this down with you just because I feel like this is a clear, nice opportunity to talk about uh, reshaping these teams that have been eliminated so far. And you just laid out really nicely, you know, last episode we covered the Mets. This episode we've also lost the Braves and Dodgers. And I don't want to forget the Mariners because you know Jerry DePoto is going to go a little bit crazy this offseason after encountering the Astros, the only heavy favorite to advance so far. But it's not like they weren't rusty. The Mariners swept them in three coin flip games. The Astros were so good, they won them all. But... I don't think they played their best in any of those games. One of them went scoreless for 17 innings. Clearly, the Mariners also believe they should be in this AL conversation. So I would love one move you would make if you were the GM of each eliminated team. If they could only focus their energy on one move, what is the most important thing for the Braves to do this offseason? Oh, I, I like this question a lot. So for, the, for me, it starts with the shortstop position. Um, and... If I was Alex Anthopoulos, if I'm not able to re-sign Dansby Swanson, I go all in for Trey Turner. That is the move I make. That's plan A, B, and C. Um, I would want Trey Turner. So what what would you do? I mean, it, it is shortstop for me. And I think, I think I would pass on Dansby Swanson. I think I would target either Bogarts. For, I think I would target Bogarts for cheaper as the Matt Olson style alternative to Freddie Freeman at this point. Uh, we'll see, but I think shortstop is definitely the position of note there. What about the Dodgers for you? You've got Bellinger who you have to clear off the roster. I think we're all agreed there. There was some conversation of him being a little frustrated by being snubbed in the game four lineup. I think it's a sad ending, but it's like, the Yankees and Joey Gallo and the Yankees and Sonny Gray. Sometimes you just got to do it. You got to tweet the goodbye video uh, and you got to move on. So I almost disqualify that. But if there's one move you have to make if you're the Dodgers, uh, and if, if Bellinger is the only clear one to you, then all right. Uh, but what is sort of the plan A for the Los Angeles Dodgers this offseason, your singular move? I'll, I'll go away from, from Cody Bellinger just because I think that is one of the more – I don't want to say obvious moves, but like it's it's definitely one that I think everybody's gonna be talking about. But yeah. Plan A with such a rotation need, um, I'd go I go for Jacob Degrom. That's that's what I would do if I I could make one move for the Dodgers. It'd be Jacob Degrom. I also I, I strongly consider Trey Turner there. Um, I mean that would make two for two um, on Trey Turner, but <laughs> I, I got to go away from that one. So give me uh, give me Jacob Degrom. For the, for the Dodgers there. How about you? Yeah, No, I, that's the exact same for me. I mean, the pitching, we it, you almost laugh at it until they actually do get eliminated. And then you get to point back like, it didn't work, folks. Like, once you lose Walker Bueller, obviously the rotation's built around him. He's your playoff stopper. He's your ace. He's everything Kershaw hasn't been. Julio Rios is your excellent playoff number two. All of a sudden, he's starting game one. If you were to just look at this Dodgers roster – and you remove the 111 wins, you would say incredible lineup, 
flawed rotation. Tony Gonsolin gives you an inning and a third. Tyler Anderson gives you five innings and they five and fly. Is it 86 pitches and they still go no more? You know, that that's thank you. Thank you. No, goodbye. And he's like, are you sure I actually have more? They're like, no, 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 goodbye. Um, <laughs> I think he probably could have given him a sixth, but they were, they didn't have enough faith in their all-star number four starter. And probably with good reason. The names just don't really line up. Andrew Heaney was an option. Dustin May came back as a starter and then kind of got hurt. That threw everything off. Dodgers need a Max Scherzer. And the only Max Scherzer available this offseason is Jacob deGrom. And I don't think he's getting he's getting a ton of money. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it's not going to be more than three years. I could see three or four years. Um, okay. I, yeah, I think you're in the right ballpark, though. I think maybe the team that gets him steps up to four years um, as like the, the winning bid. I can't see him getting five years, though, especially with his injury history. But I think three years is like the right right idea there for sure. Yeah, it, it's also tough because the, the whoever gets DeGrom is going to be one of the teams that has a lot of money to play around with. And it, the, like the alternatives for DeGrom, people are like, what about the Rangers? I, I mean, maybe what about the Rangers? But probably what about the Mets and Dodgers? That would be my guess, too. But you know what? Strange, strange things have happened in free agency. Just look at last year. Did, how many people had Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager going to the Texas Rangers? And then John Gray. I, did that happen all like that happened within a 24 hour span? All of those deals. Yeah. That was boy. Hopefully. Yeah. That was one of the more crazy times in my life. That was banana land. Do you remember where you were when either of those dropped? I was the one who dropped two of them. Yeah. Um, I was, I kid you not. Like, I'll give you actually how this ended up happening. I was watching a show. Um, I was visiting my parents. Um, and all of a sudden I got a text from a source saying, Hey, you free? Mm -hmm. um and i'm like yeah what's up i said i'm calling you i'll put my airpods in go walk into the other room and he's like simeon in the rangers um seven years it's done and i'm like oh uh, okay like at this point i start like i get to get the shakes it's like yeah i need i need to go confirm this um and i place a couple different texts and calls with other people um and then another person says um you can report it's close and all of a sudden like i have the tweet already typed out in my notes because like i know once i get this confirmed it's like i need to get this out fast um so i have all caps breaking marcus simeon and the rangers are close to a deal um phone goes absolutely berserk um and i'm getting congratulatory texts from all sorts of different people um and then one guy says hey congrats and then he's like Ar avi garcia to the, to the marlins and I'm like, wait, is that out? And he's like, no. <laughs> so I drop that. And then it's, um, then it slows down for a bit. And then I get John Gray to the Rangers. And then I drop that. I get a congratulatory text from somebody else. And then he's like, Michael, or somebody else then goes, Michael Lorenzen to the Angels. Mm -hmm. And this all happens within like a four or five hour span. Like I'm giving <laughs> you like how free agency happened last year. So like I'm trying to visit my parents and I hardly ever see them. It's just like my phone's going off like crazy. Um, yeah, that was I, at that moment. I finally knew what it felt like to be Woj. Um, <laughs> You're I, trying I, to watch I, a show. Yeah. I love Woj. Woj is the man like shout out to Woj. Um, but man, oh man, I, I love free agency. I live for that kind of stuff. And we're going to get to do it again this year. You're going to have another huge one. That's why all you people have to be subscribed to the Baseball Insiders feed. If you're coming across this via Bert's Twitter, um, via my Twitter, eh, probably Bert's Twitter, uh, you <laughs> might as well hit subscribe and be here for whenever the stream starts. Don't join us late. Join us right on time because you never know when we're going to be breaking stuff. You never know what show you're going to be in the middle of when the Texas Rangers decide two or three years ahead of schedule that they need to go on a spending spree. You just don't know. No, I mean, hey, I mean, maybe you find out on the Baseball Insiders. That's why you subscribe, everybody, right there. That's the goal, and no lockout this offseason, probably. It would be crazy if that happened. But no lockout this offseason, no condensed offseason. Winter meeting is going to be crazy. The whole couple of months are going to be nuts. Uh, I'm seeing the comments, people asking about the Giants and Aaron Judge. We're going to be getting that question every day until he finds his new home. Um, and the Yankees are not – ending their season at Yankee Stadium with game two where Aaron Judge was booed by 16 people and Bob Costas decided to make it a national event. I saw Dick Vitale tweeting about it today. That's absolutely not uh, the world I want to live in. So at least 
the least we could do is send Aaron Judge into the offseason with a better mental image of what it's like to play in New York. I see people asking about Jose Abreu in the Cubs, Carlos Correa in the Cubs. We're going to be talking Cubs all offseason long. I guarantee you that. And, and again, you will be here. Uh, people saying, I want to be here when Correa to the Cubs breaks. So do we. I want to be live on the air for that one, too. Um, get Correa out of the AL East. We already talked about the, the Orioles are spooky. Um, yeah, yes. It wouldn't surprise me at all. At, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, boy, actually, I, I like this comment from Alex Rude, by the way, because um, that was one I found out that Pollock was might be on the move, and then I speculated, hey, why don't they just trade him to the White Sox for C- Craig Kimmel? And then, like, a week later, that happened. Like, you can only get that inside one place, and that's the baseball insiders. So Yeah, I, I remember – I remember you specifically said, well, they just traded him to the White Sox for Kimbrell, and then neither player could participate in the playoffs. And Karm was like, wait, what? But you were right. Neither yeah. of them did. Boom. You know what? That's, I promise I, I don't have a crystal ball over here. Um, if I did, then, then I'd be a very rich man. But I don't. But sometimes I know things. Um, yeah. This man knows lot. things. I feel things. This man knows things. Uh, what about uh, your American League darling? Everyone loves him. You either you loved them this week because you hate the Astros. Uh, the machine kept chugging along, but the Seattle Mariners uh, are extremely well set up for the future. I don't think they need to make any drastic changes, but you know they will. Uh, they've already committed big money to Julio Rodriguez long term. What's the one reinforcement you'd make to that roster if you had the chance? So they already have the star in Julio Rodriguez. They have the rotation, which to me is one of the best in baseball. So the, the move they need to make now, I'm not going to give you a player, but I'm going to give you a position um, or like something that they just need to upgrade is they need to add a big bat. That is what they need. Um, Cause I thought that was a pretty glaring weakness, um, especially in the postseason against the Astros. Like I'll tell you that uh, that zero zero for 17 straight innings was my ideal baseball um that make me that might make me sound extremely boring you know what no. and maybe so um but i'm a huge sucker for pitching and defense and that game had a lot of it um but i also like scoring at times and yeah i, I think it became pretty clear that they needed a big bat so give me a big bat for the mariners yeah and when you are when your team is not involved there's nothing better than a pitcher's duel that somehow lasts 18 innings is a nice last minute gift to the Mariners fans too who haven't seen playoff baseball in 20 years. They go, here's an extra game. Like you're not going to get to game four. You don't get a second home game, but you get 18 innings of baseball, which is double the normal baseball. So here you guys go. Very helpful. Um, yeah. The Mariners are obviously close, but you're right. Big thumper could help Jose Abreu, who we're seeing in the comments here could help um, a big thumper. In addition to big dumper might be nice. Um, Leandro Espinal with a comment, if the Yankees lose, would Judge be disappointed to be inclined to leave the Yankees given all these Yankees disappointing seasons and the bad Yankees offense behind him? First of all, Leandro, mean comment. Why is that so rude? Uh, we started to come from Alex, rude. Such a rude comment. But while we're here, we might as well address it because uh, we're going to be talking about Game 5. It's the only ALDS or NLDS series still on the menu, unresolved. Uh, and we got to get our predictions in for uh, for tonight's game and certainly be wrong. Maybe we should just split it so one of us is right. Um, but does the Yankees' loss tonight affect Judge's free agency tangibly? Or is he wearing the New Yorker nowhere sweaters? Is he sort of dug into, I want to be here. Unless they don't pay me, then I don't. I don't think it, I don't think it impacts on one bit tonight, to be honest. And, like, I have – my reasons for that um and you like you're obviously more tied into the new york scene than i am so i'm curious what your what your take is on this but um if you look at the rest of the postseason like look at all the other teams that have been eliminated you have um you have the dodgers you have uh the mets you have the braves i mean i don't think the braves are going to be on Aaron judge by any means yeah. um but like all those teams have already been eliminated um and I, I think, I mean, if Judge ends up surveying the market, he's going to end up looking at those teams. He's going to end up looking at the Giants, who are probably going to be in there. Um, and he's going to realize, I mean, New York is a really good place to be. Um, I mean, it's just like, I, I just I just don't think it's going to end up being that. But, like, most importantly, um, 
it's going to come down to the dollar amount. And I think he proved that in turning down what their previous extension offer was before the season. Um, he's going to want to maximize his value. And whoever offers him the most money um, is probably going to end up getting him. And obviously state taxes are going to end up having a, a sizable impact here too, um, which could end up hurting the Giants chances, uh, especially in being in California. But um, yeah, I, I just think wherever offers him the most money is going to end up getting him. And I still think it's going to be the Yankees. Yeah, there was a report, an otherwise innocent report that sort of dropped earlier today that was talking about why the Yankees passed on last year's shortstop market. And they just said, well, they knew they had to throw a boatload of money at Aaron Judge, which we sort of suspected all along. We were disappointed about at the time. You know, why can't you go get both? But at the same time, like at the very least, you got to go get the one. Like if you're letting the Judge extension stop you from signing a star shortstop, then don't bungle the judge extension. And so I think Yankee fans were upset last winter when we were given Isaiah Connor falefa instead of a big name, especially because he's a better third baseman and a better utility player, and his defense has already gotten him benched in this series. And that frustration will never go away. But that was the accepted reason there was because they got to chase judge and they got to pay judge. So if this turns into we're paying neither, then I think Yankee fan revolt happens. Uh, whether there was a 62 homer season or not, but history, the shortstop money saved, the fact that they seem to know they had to save money to go overboard for someone whose age 37 season is going to look bad, but you have to pay anyway, I think it all does line up for them giving them a big payday. Yep, I think that's that's spot on. If You, you can't lose judge and also not get one of those shortstop last year because in that scenario. Like, yeah, it's got to – they basically, I don't want to say they're forced to resign Judge, but like it would be a pretty bad PR thing if they ended up losing Judge. And I'm curious how they would respond if they ended up losing him. I'm very curious, but I still don't think they will. Um, I just yeah. think, I think it's just, it's bound to happen at some point. There was some thought that was floated, I think, at the worst part of this series when it was 2 1 Guardians. That was like maybe the few like if they compensate for Judge, they'll do a Degrom Cole pairing at the top of the rotation. That makes no sense to me. The the starting pitching has been pretty great. Um, so has the Guardians. That's why we are where we are now. Um, but like we said on the earlier podcast, like the Guardians offense losing to Shane McClanahan or struggling to hit and beating Shane McClanahan and uh, Tyler Glass now and Garrett Cole is no reason to say the Guardians don't have offense. The Yankees struggling against Shane Bieber and then kind of hitting Tristan McKenzie around going yard three times in that game is no real reason to say the Yankees offense just does not show up in October. Uh, the Guardians pitching is good and the Yankees offense did show up in one of those games. So yeah. pitching wins and the pitching has won the battle or lost the battle in every game of this series so far. The Yankees lost game three because they don't have a bullpen because Aaron Boone had to go with a strange option to close out the game. He failed. The Yankees won game four because Garrett Cole was spectacular. It was exactly what they were paid uh, to receive. And now we're about to play game five, and it's going to be Aaron Savali against Jamison Tyone, and the Guardians' bullpen is fully rested. And the Yankees' bullpen isn't that damaged, but the Guardians' bullpen is just better. Where are you leaning here uh, after I know you leaned Guardians earlier in the series, and I almost wanted to, but had to give myself the Yankees in five. Yeah, I'm, I'm, boy, I'm I'm leaning Yankees just because the home field is obviously a pretty big one um, in this scenario. But the the Guardians, they have such a good opportunity here, Adam, and they remind me so much of like the 2014 Kansas City Royals in the fact that they're young. They're scrappy. They put the ball in play. They have really freaking good pitching. Um, and obviously, like, that that's the recipe for winning. And the Roy or the uh, the Guardians have done that throughout this entire season. It's how they ended up beating um, the Rays in the first series, and it's how they've taken this one to game five. But I still think the Yankees end up getting this thing done. Um I'm relying on their star power, especially with Aaron Judge. Like, this is why Judge is a $300 plus million dollar player, is for moments in games like these. Um, so, give me the Yankees, but am I confident in that? No. Because um, I, I don't know what it is, but something's tugging me in my, in my gut about uh, 
about the Guardians. Maybe it's the Chipotle burrito I had last night, but but I, I, just, yeah, I don't know. Just, okay. okay, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop beating around the bush. Give me the Yankees in this one. Okay. I'm thinking about Chipotle for dinner. I'm honestly not sure what I'm going to be doing for dinner tonight. I was thinking about it before you said that. Still thinking about it now. Got to be strategic because this game could get rain delayed. Beautiful in New York right now. Reports are still that it's going to be delayed. Don't know if it's a 9 p.m. Eastern start. Don't know when we're looking at a game. I think the Yankees either jump on Savali quick and it's a pretty easy win for the first time all series or it's a tight, tight bullpen game. Tyone is not Garrett Cole. Unlikely he shuts the Guardians out. Uh, it's either, you know, five or six, one Yankees at the end of four, or it's two, two, and you're going to that disgusting Guardians bullpen. So there are two outcomes in this game, as far as I can tell. I'm sticking with the Yankees because I'm sticking with what got me here. I would have said they were dead after game three, and Garrett Cole really stepped up. Aaron Judge also stepped up from a dead first two games of the series where he was 0 for the series with nothing but strikeouts and one little grounder. Um, then he hit a huge home run in game three. They ultimately squandered that one. Got on base with an infield single yesterday. At least he's putting bat on ball. He's making things happen. He had two long flyouts to left. He is finding his swing again. Uh, and it's huge that he didn't let himself get overwhelmed for the entirety of the series. I'm picking the Yankees, but like you, not terribly confident. And man, oh man, the Guardians are fast. Top to bottom, uh, yeah. Jose Ramirez is so quick. Steven Kwan is the most impressive player in this series. Jose Ramirez, we talked last episode about how his playoff numbers are weak. And I said, he's sure to go off in this series. He hasn't exactly gone off. He's not hitting the ball hard, but he's hitting like 500 on singles, infield hits, finding holes, great baseball player. And his speed is so underrated. The, the guardians have a very bright future. That they do. And that's basically what Ramirez has done is basically what that entire offense has done is they put the ball in play and good things happen. Um, and if that ends up happening against the Yankees today uh, and they follow that recipe, then the Yankees can end up being in some serious trouble. I'm boy, I'm completely fascinated to see how this one plays out. I'm hoping mother nature doesn't just like end up kind of piping us here and puts us in a, it put or puts us in a rain delay. Yeah. Um, but the guardians, those fans have a, a reason to be very optimistic about what they have going forward. I'm curious um, what the manager position looks like with uh, Tony Francona, um, because I know he talked to Ken Rosenthal about him not being able to do this long term. Um, so I'm curious if this is his last year or if next year is his last year or what his plan is. But either way, they're lined up to have something very, very, very special there. I would love your outsider opinion on this too, just because I'm in New York. I know how people feel here, but it feels like there is a pretty uh, positive national opinion of the Josh Naylor celebration. Uh, the censored version rounding the bases, uh, his home run to cut the deficit to three, two yesterday in the fourth. They ultimately did not score any more runs. He called Garrett Cole, his little effing son. Uh, he said it a lot. He said it when he crossed third, when he hit home, uh, I think if a Yankee did that, they'd be reviled. But since somebody did it against the Yankees, it's kind of a let the kids play scenario. I also know it's lame to tell people not to do stuff. Josh Naylor can do whatever he wants. He just opened the door up to a lot of criticism if they lose the series. But for some reason, didn't get much criticism in the moment. So I roll on that. But what are your thoughts there? Is that sort of, did that tug at you a little bit? Or you're just kind of like, oof, I, you know, I see why people would be upset, but I don't really care. Yeah, I like so. I have a take on that, but first of all, I called him Tony Francona uh, when I meant Terry Francona. I just wanted to address that and apologize to Terry Francona. Uh, my bad on on that, but um, I don't have any issue with uh, with Josh Naylor doing that whatsoever. Um, I, I think you can do those kind of things if you end up backing it up with your play, um, and that's what exactly what Josh Naylor did. So I have no issue with it whatsoever. I think just adds some more spice to the game, which is always a good thing. Let the kids play. Let's, let's let the kids have fun as, as our friend Johnny in the comments said here. Johnny's bad. I have, again, Josh Naylor could do whatever he wants. He can absolutely have fun. He can rock Garrett Cole to sleep like a baby boy. But I just think it, imagine a Yankee doing that. And then imagine people like, and then they lose. I mean, you would see that forever. I, I all I'm saying is people better plaster this around with the same energy they would have. Uh, for Oswaldo Cabrera, like standing and staring at a home run at a deep right field in game three, and then they blow that game. I heard a lot of Cleveland fans saying it's pretty embarrassing. Um, I just think people got to make Josh Naylor feel the embarrassment if they lose the game. But 
of course, knowing my luck, I'm sure they'll win the game anyway, and it will just be a celebrated moment. Um, what else? What else? What else? I mean, before we go, uh, we talked about the playoff format. I don't want to just, I don't want to leave without saying that the complaints about the playoff format started before the Dodgers even lost. Uh, there is an LA Times Dodgers editorial published before game four. <sighs> The Dodgers down 2-1 on the road. All they needed to do was win two games. They could have done it. 111 win regular season team. Published before game four saying if there was ever a chance to give the trophy to the best team and forget the World Series and just give the greatest team award to the best winners, it would be this year's Dodgers. What was that? And do you even 3% see the point of writing a column like that? I I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I story. still can't believe it. That's why I, we could have ended the show, but I'm just like, I don't want to do this whole thing without talking about this Dodgers guy. What what are you doing? I, I I thought it was fake when I first saw it. Like, I'm not trying to be like rude to the Los Angeles Times or the author of that story, but like uh, I can't believe that story was actually written because I mean, obviously being good in the regular season, that's important, Adam. Like that's very important. But where you make your money is the postseason. And the Dodgers came up short. And you don't just give awards to teams that were the best in the regular season. Like, that just doesn't happen. Um, it shouldn't happen. Um, but, yeah, that, that story blew my mind. That was uh, that was one that I don't think I'll ever forget because it was just that that bizarre. Like, well, I, I remember you and I, like, in our one of the fan-sided uh, baseball channels for Slack, um, we both had, like, the same reaction of, like, what in the absolute world is this? Like, what was your reaction when you saw that? <laughs> I was uh, I was on a long walk. I was I was clearing my head after game two, and I I just couldn't believe that the team. Like, I understand being frustrated, and yep. no one is telling Dodger fans, Met fans, Braves fans to not be like, we won hundred games an hour. Season's over. This is so stupid. It obviously feels stupid, and you go through a period where you say, I don't need it. You go through fan, you know, accountability where you're like, I don't need to see any of these people ever again. I'm done. I don't care about them. Five hours pass and you're like, get me to spring training, right? You're already back and ready again. The fact that they're writing this column before the season's even over, giving the Dodgers no chance, the 111 win Dodgers, you're already asking for a consolation prize before the series has even ended. My jaw was on the floor. I understand fans of a certain age too. I mean, there was a time before all of us were around and following baseball where the best record in each league is the World Series. So there really was a reward for being the best team on a balanced schedule. And I know Keith Olbermann tweeted this. Like, the regular season existed. You played the same teams. Everybody got their shots in. You can never fully balance a schedule because there are going to be injuries. Someone's going to miss an ace. Someone's going to hit, you know, two top starters, and you have to face some injured guy and a minor league fill-in and whatnot. It's never going to be fully balanced. But – they had the best of both worlds in the 50s and 60s. You won your league. You got to meet in the World Series after a great regular season. And to advocate for that, I think the best you can say is, oh, man, this Dodgers team really deserved a shot to play in the World Series. Like, they clearly won their league. They clearly put the Padres in the rear view. But that said, you won one division series game. You had two of them at home. You split them. You lost them both on the road. The opportunity was right in front of you. You did not take it. Bingo. And... They, that ended up, I mean, there, there, you can look at a lot of different things that ended up costing the Dodgers in the regular or in, in the postseason, I mean, but the, the Padres were simply the better team um, in that. I, I mean, I don't think anybody can argue that whatsoever, but yeah, just uh, that's why no trophies are handed out uh, or during the regular season because anything can happen in the postseason, especially in today's era. Um, boy, the Dodgers, the Braves, and the Mets all found that out the hard way. Yeah, and this sport is hard. So sometimes you have to find it out the hard way. Yep. That's all That's all there is to it. The Guardians are giving the Yankees a hard lesson in coasting past the first round. If they didn't learn it from the other three series, they should learn it now. Game five coming up tonight, even though Aaron Boone just said the weather forecast is, quote, not good. So strap in for a long one or strap in for Shane Bieber tomorrow. We've got more for you on Thursday. You can catch us on the Baseball Insiders YouTube channel live 3 30 eastern time on mondays and thursdays we'll be right back but the best way to catch up with us is subscribe i see alec thomas in the comments asking what are steps one could take to one day work as a baseball writer um i mean 
there's no better practice as I see it than just getting reps. These are our reps. The, this show is us sharing the information we've gleaned with all of you. Um, when I get off this show, I write, I write about the team I'm passionate about. Um, I, I don't stop and think I share my opinion. I hope that people value it. And, and Bert, like, I, I'm sure you sort of came up the same way. I did. And that's something is like you learn by trial and error and you got to like experiment to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, and it's by getting reps, but it's also by reading other writers. Um, and I, I learned so much when I read different writers, not just because of their baseball knowledge, but with the way they frame things, with the way they articulate things, with how they do go about writing a certain thing. Um, and like some of the guys that I read every everything they write um i read is just to name a couple ken rosenthal uh he's the absolute king in what he does um andy mccullough with the athletic he's phenomenal mark craig also with the athletic he's an editor now uh, but when he writes it's appointment reading um jeff passan who's wonderful um and there's a couple other espn writers um i'm sh- there's one that i read religiously um i can't remember his name but you learn so much by reading what others do. Um, and once you get to like actually know them as people, um, I've learned, I've been very fortunate to have some very good mentors. Um, and it's just like Ken Rosenthal, Heyman, Jeff Pass, and all those guys have, have mentored me. Um, and I've been very lucky for that. But yeah, just find an opportunity and maximize it because you never know what's going to be able to happen there. Yeah. Find your niche too. follow whatever that hook is for you. Is it prospects? You know, I love Kylie McDaniel. I read him on ESPN. Is it, you know, history? There's plenty of great baseball history. Is it chasing scoops? If so, you're in the right place. Keep following us. Keep following Robert. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, big game coming up tonight. We hope, I think might be fun to watch if it gets played sick of the rain. If not, probably Shane Bieber tomorrow gets Nesta Cortez potentially. Maybe a more interesting pitching matchup for the world at large, but would be pretty upsetting to lose another game to rain here. Uh, Bert, thanks as always for joining me, man. This was another total pleasure, and it's crazy how many upsets and how many teams off seasons we've already had to start the clock on way too early in just a couple weeks of podcasting. It's freaking bonkers. Uh, what a way to start the podcast, Adam. Uh, but I appreciate you as always. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and please subscribe. Um, because we'll be best pals, pen pals, maybe, um, and all, all the above. But we appreciate you dearly. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like we got a subscriber at the end of this show. So be like him uh, and keep following the show. We'll be back uh, on Thursday afternoon, 3.30. This is a place for baseball. If you love baseball, this is the spot for you. Cannot stress that enough. 3.30 Eastern on Thursday. Until next time, Robert Murray, I'm Adam Weinrib. Go baseball. Go baseball. <laughs>